This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is purpose. It's the beginning of another trilogy on the big questions in life uh, that I do with a philosopher, a theologian, and a scientist. Today I will be speaking with philosopher David Livingstone Smith, and the conversation will be coming up in a moment. As mentioned, the subject is purpose. David Livingstone Smith is a philosopher who has joined me to take on the role of the philosophical viewpoint. Uh, David, if you could take uh, three or four minutes, talk about uh, a little bit about your life, where you come from, how you uh, got into philosophy, a couple of your books, and your general take on purpose in life, if there is, and whatnot. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um... So I was born in New York City. I grew up in Florida. I went over to the United Kingdom in my 20s. Uh, I dropped out of school here in the United States. I rejoined my education uh, in the United Kingdom. And my first career actually wasn't in philosophy. I was a psychotherapist, a psychoanalytic psychotherapist. I got into um, philosophy really by accident. I didn't have a PhD, and as I was really enjoying the academic life. I figured I'd get one. And it turned out that my scholarship was such that the most straightforward way to get a PhD was to do it in philosophy. I hadn't done any philosophy before then at all. Uh, but a philosopher at the University of London very generously agreed to take me on as a graduate student. And I did my initial philosophical work on Freud, on Freud as a philosopher, and my early philosophical publications, as opposed to my publications specifically on psychoanalysis, uh, were a philosophy of psychoanalysis. Now, I've really moved on a lot since then, although I still dabble in that area. I write on Freud from time to time, and he's mentioned in almost all of my publications. Still, he's a, an intellectual influence on me. Uh, but I became interested in uh, a bunch of kind of intersecting issues about, oh, maybe 10 years ago. No, longer than that, 15 years ago. Um, I had developed an interest in deception and self-deception. And that culminated in writing a book called Why We Lie, which was published in 2004. And after writing that book, I was casting around for another major project. I'm writing papers and articles and that kind of stuff alongside, but I want to write another book. And I thought, well, what's an arena where deception and self-deception play a, a very important role? And I came to the conclusion I should investigate war, uh, which turned out to be an intimidatingly huge topic. There are something like 54,000 books written on the American Civil War alone. But I found that very few of those uh, books were, and, and papers for that matter, were concerned with war as a human experience. So actually, my task was a lot easier than I had initially feared. So that book came out in 2007. It's called The Most Dangerous Animal. And when I was writing that book towards, actually, when I was researching the penultimate chapter, I came across the fact that there's a lot of dehumanizing imagery in war, dehumanization of the enemy, representations of enemies as subhuman creatures. And I thought, oh, how interesting. This might be something to, to follow up. And a friend convinced me that should be my next book project. I discovered, to my surprise, at the time, the literature on dehumanization was remarkably small, given um, how popular the topic is. Um, what I mean by that is if you Google the word dehumanization, you'll get a gazillion uh, responses. But there's very, very little scholarly literature on it, and most of that literature is in the field of social psychology, very little in philosophy. Um, and so that's been my preoccupation since 2011, when my book Less Than Human came out. And Less Than Human is, I believe still, the only single author interdisciplinary 
treatment of dehumanization ever published. So, so I mean, very generally, I'm a philosopher. I've been characterized as a philosopher who likes to get his hands dirty, and or a feral philosopher. In other words, uh, I think a lot of what goes on in philosophy is is uninteresting because it's detached from matters that make a difference to life and make a difference to 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 human beings. So that philosophy often just doesn't engage with what matters to people. And I think we have a really important role to play in addressing serious, serious issues, issues like war and dehumanization and deception. Now, it, it turns out that you really, it's it's impossible to make much headway with any of those topics unless we attend to the issue of purpose, what things are for, um, and unless we have actually a very you know, articulated notion of, uh, of what I like to call non-intentional purpose or sub-intentional purpose. That is, sometimes when people talk about purpose, they mean uh, what we intend. So my purpose in lifting this coffee cup is to bring coffee to my mouth. Well, it's because I intend it. But the idea of purpose is actually much more far-reaching than that. Because we can also say things like uh, the purpose of eyes is for seeing Aristotle. Yeah. A thousand years ago made that, that point, but that obviously has nothing to do with anyone's intention. So that, that to, to um, understand that, we need some sort of a biological notion of purpose, purpose that can sit alongside the intentional notion of purpose. Yeah. Um... Let me just uh, go back to initially you talked about being in psychotherapy and you mentioned Freud being an influence and uh, in I don't know how many years you were a psychotherapist but uh, I would think that most of the problems that human beings have whether it's dealing with an addiction, uh, dealing with a divorce, uh, career woes, uh, parental stuff, uh, or whatever it may be dealing with certain impulses or whatnot that a lot of it has to do with people seemingly lost and not knowing why they exist. And certainly when we look at lower animals that don't have the cogitative abilities that human beings do, uh, you know, uh, an ant, while it may be part of a super organism, it knows its particular purpose. It's a drone or it takes care of the larvae or it, you know, builds the, the nest or it f fends off uh, uh, another ant colony or termites or whatnot. Uh, but as we get to, to more and more complex animals, whether it's reptiles and mammals and birds, uh, primates, and then humans, it seems that the, as the mind complexes, there is this sort of searching out for why am I here? Um, do you find that, or did you find that that was maybe at the center of all of the problems that you would de deal with with your clients? No, I wouldn't go that far at all. No? Um, I, it, it, it's... Um... In fact, it might be a, a symptom of, of something else that people ruminate on that. But, but that is an issue, and it's an issue because we human beings are able to deliberate, right? We're, yeah. a, we're able to reflect on ourselves and reflect on our lives and consider alternatives in ways that I would guess the, the vast majority of other animals can't do. So, you know, our capacity to do this creates problems for us. We're confronted with, with decisions all the time. And, you know, in, in a way, philosophy began with that. If we look back to someone like Socrates, I mean, he, the, the question that concerned him most is something like this. Well, we've got a life to live. How should we live it? <laughs> you know, what should we do with this precious minute by minute diminishing resource and that's a really hard question to answer you know what should you do hmm. how should you spend your life well let's uh, talk a bit about violence in the abstract since uh, a couple of your books deal with war and demeaning um just on a personal level do you think that the 
will to demean someone, whether it's at a very personal level because of looks or intelligence, whether it's at a racial or cultural level, whether it's via religion or other philosophical differences, uh, is that the individual you think trying to gain purpose by denying the purpose to someone else? Um, again, I wouldn't. I wouldn't generalize. That might mm. might be the case sometimes. Um, the uh, demeaning or, or harming others uh, can have a variety of purposes. In other words, it can be for lots of things. But if mm. I'm to offer a generalization. Uh, Violence of the most significant sort, the sorts of violence we see in, in war and genocide, and, and to some extent this trickles down to lower level violence, snubbing, and uh, the unnecessary uh, hurting of feelings, and so on, um, is motivated by, the, by gain, or the promise of gain. Right? So the fact is, unfortunately, that it can often be in our interest to harm others, often to harm others in, in very, very terrible ways, by exterminating them or enslaving them, or, or, or simply, uh, again, on, on the more, on the lower level, the, the more micro level, by damaging their reputation, um, by degrading them, by demeaning them, by excluding them, and so on. So one of the really interesting, one of the things that really interests me in, in this respect is the tension between our tendency to resonate with others, our tendency to be compassionate with others, and our projects of, of harming them. I mean, that's, that's a, kind of a really, really interesting tension in that often we recognize that it's in our interests to do harm to others, to damage them in some way, but in order to actually make good on that, in order, in order to actually execute it, uh, we need to find some way of managing our more compassionate tendencies, some way of, of blunting those, those sensibilities. Uh, well, let's talk uh, then uh, about the different types of purpose culturally. Um, there's the purpose that's a causative purpose. You were talking about, you know, that the what is the purpose of an eye to help you see. And then there's sort of the teleological, which is sort of ends-based purpose that, uh, you know, Stalin had a five-year plan, you know. And so there was a purpose to, we're going to dam up these rivers so that we can create more electricity so that the Soviet Union can modernize and compete against the West. And you could lay out a litany of uh, goals. Um, yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about those two types of purpose, and then we oh. can go a little bit further. Okay. So uh, let, let's start with the second one because it's it's perhaps more straightforward than the first one, yeah. and and less contentious philosophically. So setting on a purpose, we could call those projects. Couldn't we? I mean, there's something that an individual or a, a group of people. Um, is aiming for. Well, what's necessary in order for that to be the case? Well, we have to be able to picture some sort of end. We have to be able to represent it to ourselves. And we have to be able to represent states and affairs that, that aren't actual, that don't exist. So we have to be able to think about something that doesn't exist, right? So if you're trying to bring something about, by definition, that thing hasn't been brought about yet, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so that requires pretty powerful imaginative capacities. Um, so that's necessary. Another thing that's necessary is, of course, a desire. So we don't have purposes in that sense of the word unless we have desires. You don't aim for something unless you want to bring that something about, bring it into actuality. And uh, finally, we have to believe, we have to be capable of beliefs. And by um, beliefs, I don't mean something spooky. I just mean uh, a commitment to the, an endorsement of the notion that something is true. That's how philosophers use the, the term belief. Yeah. Uh, so you have to believe then that 
by performing certain sorts of actions, you will bring about this thing, <laughs> this state of affairs, which satisfies your desire, which hasn't come into existence yet. So you can see right away that um, purpose, in that sense of the word, requires a host of very sophisticated uh, mental capacities, um, and, and may in fact be dependent on something like our capacity for language, you know, which gives us the sorts of concepts that allows us to exercise that imaginative uh, capacity. So, you know, you have to be a pretty smart primate to have purposes. In, in that sense. I mean, just the requirement of being able to visualize something that doesn't exist is, is pretty impressive when we possibly think about it. Yeah. Now, the other kind of purpose. Um, so, philosophers, at least since Aristotle, have, have, have suggested that that there's this different sort of purpose that has nothing to do with intentions. And that's the sort of purpose, let's call it biological purpose. All the, you know, the, the, the classic examples are biological examples, although it actually does extend a bit further than biology. Uh, so let's, let's take the example of, um, of eyes. So it's intuitive, and most every biologist would accept this, that there's something that eyes are for. That is, eyes are for seeing, for, for taking in visual information. Well, how do we explain this? It can't be um, that this is just explicable in terms of what eyes do. Um, just a second, my picture went off. There it is. Okay. It can't be explicable just in terms of what eyes do. Actually, to see this, let's give a, another example, which is um, was, was uh, made fun of by uh, Voltaire. What are noses for? All right. Noses are for breathing and for olfaction, right? That yeah. sounds reasonable. But if we're going to say, well, what noses are for is just what they do. Then we would have to say noses are for holding up eyeglasses. And that starts sounding a little bit peculiar. I don't think we want to say the purpose. I mean, we might use noses in that way intentionally, but the purpose that inheres in that little structure on our faces, surely it's not plausible to say that it's for holding up eyeglasses. So we need a deeper story yeah. to account for the purpose of nose or an eye or, or, or certain forms of behavior. If we look at non-human animals, say a threat display. Mm. When an animal behaves in a way that has the purpose of repelling uh, other animals. And, uh, and actually, we have to extend this beyond animals. We have to look at structures in other sorts of organisms, like plants. And maybe when we get a little bit further along, I'll give you my, my favorite example of, of this, yeah. which I use in, in a lot of my philosophical publications. Too. Well, let me just, let me just uh, uh, take off from what you had just said okay. about the nose, because... I, I know, for example, as a young boy, I was always into dinosaurs, and in recent last, well, this century, basically, it's become pretty commonly accepted that a lot of the meat-eating theropod dinosaurs probably were covered in feathers, uh, yeah. even as large as Tyrannosaurus rex, which was heresy 25, 30 years ago. And the idea is that, uh, you know, when I grew up, Archaeopteryx was supposedly the first bird, which was this yeah. little dinosaur covered in uh, feathers. But... It seems to me that, like what you were saying about the nose, feathers initially uh, came about as fur, as, as warming devices. It was yeah. only through evolution and blind chance that some of the smaller, lighter dinosaurs 
found that feathers could, uh, certain types of feathers could help in gliding and then in actual propelled flight. So yeah. if we were talking about what is the purpose of a feather, it would change. And of course, you can't really talk about purposiveness and evolution. It's it's utterly random things and, and, and things evolve. So certainly in a cultural sense, the nose is like the feather in that, yes, it's for olfaction and for yeah. breathing, yeah. but it, it, it's handy that it does come in once we invented eyeglasses that, that we could put them there. <laughs> Very handy indeed. So I think the dinosaur example is an actually good one, and it, it, it can propel us into a deeper expor exploration of what biological purpose is. And yes, you're absolutely right. Bio biological purposes can and very often do change yeah. over time. So so look, Aristotle thought, oh, for, let, let me make another point first. The notion of purpose is crucial for making sense of the ideas of uh, of something working or not working, functioning or being dysfunctional. Because those judgments are made with respect to the purpose that we attribute to it. This is true as, as true of artifacts as it is of you know, biological features. So what makes it the case that my washing machine isn't functioning? Well, it's not washing clothes, right? Yeah. Uh, why is that washing clothes is its purpose? Well, I wouldn't want to say, well, what makes the case my washing machine isn't functioning is it, it isn't making a humming noise. The humming noise is just a side effect of yeah. it's executing its, its purpose. Similarly, the human heart, you know, the purpose of the heart is to pump blood, not to make an appealing rhythmic sound. Yeah. That's just part of it, the, the way the apparatus works in order to pump blood. Okay, so Aristotle thought, uh, the purpose of a biological feature was that function that it performs to enhance the flourishing of the organism possessing the feature. So that you know that would um, that he he for instance explained the the function of the teeth of carnivorous animals in terms of tearing flesh, which is pretty reasonable. And why was that their function? Because it's in virtue of tearing flesh that, that the teeth of these animals enabled or contributed to the flourishing of the animal. But that, that um, Aristotle talking about what the feature does creates a problem. And we can see this if we go, go to eyes. What is, Aristotle wanted to understand what, a, what, what features of organisms are functionally. So an eye is that which is for seeing. So you take the function and that defines, you know, what what the, the organ is for. Well, that would imply that, you know, if someone goes blind, their eyes don't, those blobs of things on their face don't perform the function of seeing, then they stop being eyes, right? Mm. We don't want that. We want to say they're still eyes. They're just not fulfilling their purpose. And Darwin solves this problem for us. He solves this problem for us because what, Dar what Darwinian thinking and those philosophers who have harnessed Darwinian thinking to approach this issue of function realized is it's not so much what a thing does now, but what it did mm -hmm. in, in the past, in the lineage. So we can say this, and this is this is a, a an analysis, a very influential analysis from the American philosopher Ruth Millikan, is that the reason that eyes are foreseeing is that if we look earlier in the in the lineage, the reproductive lineage, uh, it's because eyes um, gathered visual information that they contributed to their continued reproduction. In other words, by gathering, by having an organ that does this, those, those organisms which possess these things reproduced yeah. rather than went extinct. Okay, so now that, you know, that can take us to dinosaurs and feathers. So feathers, yeah, very probably started out for thermoregulation. So there was some, you know, peculiar mutation such that let's call them feather precursors because feathers probably took a long time to develop 
as feathers. This 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 uh, mutation caused uh, the, the the individual dinosaur that possessed it to have some kind of stuff growing on its surface, and that protected it um, from the deleterious effects of temperature changes. So that that dinosaur with that inheritable mutation uh, reproduced more effectively than its competitors and passed on the proto feathers to its offspring. And they reproduced more effectively. So it was in virtue of thermoregulation that these proto feathers were reproduced. It's in virtue of that effect that they were reproduced. And on Millikan's analysis, that's what gave them the purpose or the biological function. We can use those terms interchangeably if we're careful. But function can mean other things as well. Yeah. So it's in virtue of that 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 purpose. We'll stick with that language. Uh, or rather, it's in virtue of that effect that the proto feathers acquired that purpose. Further down the line, some of those little lighter, faster dinosaurs uh, got some uplift from the full-blown feathers that these proto-feathers had developed into. That enhanced their reproductive success. These feathers then contributed to the reproductive success of these organisms in virtue of allowing them to uh, do something like flying and eventually to, to actually fly. So there we have an evolutionary story of a change of function, uh, the change of purpose. But, you know, notice none of this has anything to do with anyone's intentions. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, let, let me go back to the human uh, animal here uh, and talk about war, because you, your book, Most Dangerous Animal, uh, talks about the origins of war. And it seems to me that war as a tool, say, uh, to have some purpose, uh, whether it's to conquer a river or to conquer a fertile area or... Uh, in, in later, more sophisticated cultures for higher or more complicated reasons. Um, I know in the last few years, uh, Steven Pinker uh, had released a, a book talking about the decline of violence overall, how that uh, in hunter-gatherer tribes, there would be total war. If there were 50 people on each side, each tribe would battle until they killed all 50 of the other people. Um, so p war seemed to have uh, if not an intended that the people, the, the cave people were cogitating that we must get our genes out and by eradicating the other people. But they, they want, they had the purpose of, we want this river. We want this good land. We want these animals in this forest. We're going to battle for it. Do you think that if you agree that war has somehow, uh, despite what people think that uh, we are becoming more peaceful. Is war a good example of sort of like a cultural feather in that its original purpose may have been for A, but it's somehow slightly shifted now as civilization has grown? Uh, well, uh, I, I think the, the origins of war are actually really surrounded in obscurity. Yeah. Uh, the, the evidence prior to 10 or 12,000 years ago is ambiguous at best. So I, I don't accept the story that, uh, that Stephen Pinker says about prehistory. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it, it overreaches. And the, his examples of contemporary tribal peoples is a mix. Some are hunter-gatherers, some are horticulturalists, and so on. And even the contemporary hunter-gatherers, I mean, we, we, we just don't have grounds for generalizing from them. Um, so the unambiguous evidence of the origins of war comes in the, uh, the late Stone Age, the Neolithic period, where for the first time we have large settled populations with, with with territory to defend, mm -hmm. right? When you have a city like Jericho, yeah. uh, you, you can't just pick up and leave like you can if you're a, a, a forager, right? Yeah. Uh, you're there, you have to defend it. You have to um, uh, also, as your population expands, acquire more 
territory to feed that population. And you have to motivate people then to engage in acts of violence. So, I mean, sir, it, it, it's extremely plausible that in deeper prehistory there were these sort of, um, rather than organized war, these feuds between groups who were contesting over, over resources. But I would imagine in those kinds of cir circumstances, and what we know about hunter-gatherer people, really everyone had some skin in the game, right? It, these are small, probably very cooperative, very egalitarian communities, uh, who if they, if, if they were engaged you know, in organized conflict with others, would do so because it was clearly in their interests. Now, once you get to what's recognizably war, considerably later, it's not like that because we what we have here is is highly stratified societies where there are laborers and there are uh, rulers, elites, and so on. Mm -hmm. And war is then typically undertaken at the behest of these elites who want to extend their their empires. Um, now, that requires them to find some way of motivating the, uh, the ordinary folks to go out and do two things which are very, very difficult to do. One is to expose yourself to circumstances in which you have a very high probability of being killed or enslaved. No one in their right mind wants to do that if they don't have skin in the game. Uh, the other, which is grossly underestimated in the literature, perhaps until very recently, I mean, it's still underestimated, but there's a growing literature on this, and I think it's very important, has to do with the difficulty in killing others, particularly when it's close up and personal. Despite what you see in the movies, this if you're at all a psychologically reasonably normal person, it is extraordinarily difficult and extraordinarily traumatic to, you know, to, to crack someone's rock, head open with a rock or plunge a blade into their guts. So the elites have, from the time of the war started onwards, had to find some ways of getting people to do this stuff. Um, it, and their religious ideology so well, you know, if you do this, you, you'll join the, the ancestors in paradise and the afterlife. Simple coercion helps as well. If you don't do this, you, we're going to chop your head off. And also more sophisticated methods, the use of drugs to blunt people's sensibilities, uh, ritual practices to place them in altered states of consciousness. And uh, this really takes me to the penultimate chapter of the war book and, and my most recent book, um, the dehumanization of, of the enemy. If they're not really human beings and they're some sort of noxious or vicious uh, organism, then we are freed at least temporarily from the inhibitions we might have against really doing harm to them. Um. Let me talk a little bit about war and also about extermination. And I want to use contrast sort of accidental extermination of species versus uh, genocide within humans. Uh, it, but first, war would seem to me to be a fairly ineffective way to try to uh, accomplish something because there's the old saying that once the first shot is fired, all plans go to hell in war. Yeah. Um, and so you have the law of unintended consequences coming up. And I'm thinking of, you know, 13,000 or depending on recent discoveries anywhere from 13 to 30,000 years ago, as the ancestors of Native Americans came into North America via the Bering Strait during the Ice yeah. Ages, that uh, the megafauna, the, the mastodons, the mammoths, the, yeah. yeah. really, uh, the, 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 the saber-toothed cats and whatnot, all these huge animals who had no, had, who were at the apex of their niches, all of a sudden come this band of hairy humans over, and within two or 3,000 years, most of them seem to be exterminated. And that's not proof yeah. that humans were behind it, but it, it, it's likely given our past. It's very likely. And yeah. so, given that, is there a difference between, say, that, where the, the, we come into the valley and we just want to reap all the beaver tails and we wipe out the beavers, 
is there a different impulse between that and say the desire to uh, remove this set of people who are on that land because we want it? Yeah. Well, there are similarities and there's differences. Yeah. Right? So the, the similarity, I think, is resource hunger. Um, I mean, this actually goes back to what we're talking about intentional purposes. Yeah. The, the blessing and curse of our species, the, you know, what's enabled us to be so successful and indeed so successful that we're in the process of wiping ourselves out is our capacity for limitless imagination. Um, and so we, we are experts at transcending limitations and boundaries because we can see stuff on the other side. So we resource, we being resource hungry, uh, primates, yeah, we, we will, we will degrade our environment. And whenever human beings are settled, they degrade their environments, even temporarily settled. That's why, you know, hunter gatherers have to move on. Uh, so yeah, wiping out the, the megafauna, uh, if, the, the most reasonable scenario, I think, is, is wow, there, there, there are these big walking larders here uh, that we can eat up and we can use their body parts and so on. Let's, let's go for it. Um, and similarly, of course, we find this in war. Um, oh, oh, let's make the distinction, though, that if you're a band of <clears throat> hunter-gatherers having crossed the Bering Straits, to this paradise of large uh, of megafauna, um, it's it's going to be advantageous to all of the individuals in the group to you know to cooperate to bring down the mastodon, right? And in war, that's typically not the case. It's not advantageous to all the individuals in the group. It's advantageous to a minority, to a minority and a majority actually uh, probably suffer more than anything else. Okay, so that's that's the similarity. Consumption. Yeah. But the difference is that it's not normally the case that when um, uh, non-human animals are exterminated, uh, first of all, it's usually not deliberate. It's simply a consequence. Whereas in, in wars of extermination, it's deliberate. We're, we're setting out to wipe these people off the face of the earth. What underpins that deliberateness is very often um, a belief that, um, that this is a good thing. It's a morally good thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the paradoxes of war and genocide uh, that wars and genocides tend to be undertaken because uh, they're seen as virtuous, right? You're saving the world from some terrible evil. I mean, these these people or these vermin, um, I use the term with reference to yeah. denegrated people, uh, should not exist. They're, they're destroying everything that's, that's of value. So we have an obligation, a moral obligation to wipe them out. That, that might, you know, you, you would find something similar, say, in efforts to, to exterminate, say, I guess, pigs, <laughs> something like that. Um, but, but on the whole, the, the difference between the two cases is really quite profound. Well, let's end this segment there, uh, since we've talked and given some more concrete examples. In the next segment, I'd like to get maybe a little bit more abstract and a little more philosophical, and we'll do that when we return. In the first segment, uh, talked a little bit about uh, uh, some examples of different types of uh, purpose, and uh, both culturally and uh, uh, in uh, I guess a functional sense. Uh, I just want to uh, have one other question, I guess, in that vein, and then I'll switch gears. Um, there are several types of systems that human beings have developed to harness purpose. Uh, there's uh, religion, there's politics, there, off, there is philosophy, there is, I guess, some sort of other s social constructs. You could come with the good of the community, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
the common wheel. Um, do all of those, do you think, uh, stem from the same impulse, or are they things that derive from different impulses, some good, some bad, but they use the same ends? Uh, yeah, I, I think they're probably quite varied, as, as most interesting things are, right? Um, and we can, you know, pull out one or another strand of, of explanation. I mean, all of these things, I guess, maybe with the exception of philosophy, certainly religion and politics, are what I like to call efforts at self-engineering. So, because we are so um, smart, we've got these great big brains that have gotten our species into terrible trouble. Um, well, because we're so smart, we can reflect on the sources of our own behavior and work out strategies for manipulating our own behavior. And this, this gives us immense, immensely more behavioral flexibility than any other organism. So politics and religion do this, you know. So, you know, to put it crudely, polit politics and religion um, say something like this. Well, how can we get people to behave in certain ways? And then what can we do to produce this effect? So I already gave the example of religious ideologies uh, having the power to get people to get killed. <laughs> you know, if, if you're the, the head of an, an Assyrian phalanx, uh, 2,500 years ago or whatever it was, probably a bit longer ago than that, you're pretty sure you're going to die. You're walking into death. Mm -hmm. Well, what sensible organism does that? Um, no sensible organism does that. But religious ideologies and other sorts of ideologies have the power to get people to perform these acts very importantly, which are often contrary to their own best interests. So religion and politics, we, we get this kind of harnessing of uh, human beings for, um, for other ends, harnessing of, of human behavior for ends that are in the service of projects, typically of those who are in the positions of power who can implement them the kings and the priests and, and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah, philosophy, no. Philosophy, uh, at least fairly recently, doesn't motivate people to do much at all. Uh, but maybe we want to look at this from a slightly different way. So, I mean, the word purpose is really tricky, isn't it? it it means lots of different things. And when people talk about the purpose of life or the meaning of life, um, sometimes they mean something like, well, what are we here for? And I think most philosophers would say, we're not here for anything. I mean, we are consequences of evolution. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. And But I, I think when people worry about this, that's not really what they're concerned with. They're really concerned with how can I live a little, how can I, an individual, live a life that's meaningful, that's purposeful, that kind of matters? How can I lead a good life? And I think, I think that's what, you know, bugs most people most and they only go to the other thing what's the meaning of life in general what are we here for in the hope of getting some uh, guidance about how to live a meaningful life themselves a purposeful life themselves and you know that becomes a really then hard question because in order to answer that question we have to consider what's of value what ought, either what ought we be deep to be aiming at, or ultimately what is it that we can't help but aim at? Um, so Aristotle thought that we can't help but aim at 
um, what he called eudaimonia, which is sometimes translated as happiness, but I think fulfillment is a better word. And he had views about what is necessary for any human being to lead a fulfilling life. And that Aristotle thought what's necessary is, um, is, is to reason. And, and what, what he means there, I think, is to deliberate, to figure out, to, you know, it's doing stuff for, for reasons. Um, I don't think that's terribly helpful. Um, and uh, I certainly disagree with the famous um, quote from Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. I think that's really needs a little bit of defending. It doesn't seem very plausible to me. So what's of value? Well, people, philosophers on this issue are divided as, as they are on most issues. Some, some think that ultimately all that's of value is pleasure. Um, others have, have different views of what constitutes a, a good life. Yeah, you just when you mention that, oftentimes you hear parents say, uh, "I just want you know Sally or Bob to to be happy in life." And I think to myself when I hear that, they mean well, but if the only thing you want to do is sort of be self satisfied and happy, what a shallow existence! Um, and I, I'm not saying that one has to necessarily uh, make a great invention or be a great artist to have purpose, but just to say, oh, I want to just reproduce, have 2.3 kids, have a house in the suburbs, and, you know, have a good 401k plan. That, that, I just find that just very programmed. And I wanted to also talk a, a bit about, uh, since in, in the last 150 or so years, since we mentioned Darwin a couple of times, the idea of nature versus uh, uh, nurture, and that that we ha we have this uh, idea about like uh, we were talking about uh, maybe having the state be the purpose or God be the purpose for politics or, or religion. Um, it seems that evolution has brought more to the fore individual humans' idea of a purpose. Uh, from what I've read historically, individuals might, they may have been a shoe cobbler, they may have been uh, in the merchant class, they may have been serfs uh, or whatnot in the various societies around the world, but they themselves didn't have these grand dreams. You know, we hear all the time, you know, you can do anything, which I think is one of the most deme demeaning and most uh, oh, yeah. frustrating true. things people can say, because you can't be everything. I, 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 I'm never going to be an opera singer. I'm never going to play basketball like LeBron James. I'm never going to be able to do A, B, C, and a thousand other things. But you have to find that thing that you can fit in. And maybe you can only be a happy person who pays their taxes. But that's good enough if that's you're fulfilling the maximum that you can do. But we seem to have lost that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I mean, this is, <laughs> you can do anything that's so absurd yeah. and so oppressive. Because then, of course, if, if, if you don't, yeah. then it's your fault. Isn't right. It? It's, there's this denial of, of human limitation, which I'm afraid is so embedded in uh, American ideology. This is the American dream, right? Yeah. And uh, so work hard, yeah. and you'll be successful. Well, that's ridiculous. Yeah. You can you might be you can be successful without working hard. In fact, luck plays a big part in many many things in life, yeah. and you can work extremely hard and be utterly unsuccessful. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I was I lost track of a little bit of, of, uh, of what you're saying. Yeah, so Well yeah. I'll give you an example. My, my 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 dad, he died at the age of sixty six of cancer. He had a fifth grade education. He was yeah. a good, decent human being. He loved his wife, my mom. Uh, he he tried to provide for me and my sister. He worked until he was sixty three then just like three weeks after he retired, he was diagnosed with uh, two forms of cancer and he spent the last three years basically just withering away. So yeah. in a certain sense, I mean, he's a perfect example of someone who did everything supposedly right. He w he knew his limitations. He was uh, a man, he, he got a, a decent job in a civil service uh, and whatnot and was able to provide minimally, yeah. but life gave him nothing. And 
And, you know, you look at someone like him and it's almost, you know, the Sisyphean thing. You keep pushing the rock up there, but there has to be a purpose. Otherwise, if the rock keeps falling down, it becomes a bad joke. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we all need something to get us through the night, right? Yeah. We all need something. And this kind of comes back to, to my interest in self-deception. Self-deception is often seen as some sort of a pathology. I don't think so. I think, I think it's a necessary condition of, of human life. We need we need something <laughs> to to facing reality is not necessarily always a really great thing, and so sometimes sometimes we need fictions to motivate us to keep pushing that damn rock yeah. up the hill and and uh, it rolling down, and we have to you know keep keep at it or else despair and and. There are fictions available to us. Well, let me just ask you, yeah. uh, since you said you started as a psychotherapist in yeah. a Freudian way, you know, Freud was the person who wanted to always dig at the, the little uh, veneers that we'd throw up. Do you think that's necessarily a good idea? Because, you know, if you were sexually abused, and now it's not as, I mean, it's still something people don't want to talk about, but it's not as verboten as it was a hundred or more years ago. If people create these little fictions in their mind, there's a reason to do that. It's evolutionary adaptable that the mind would say, oh, I saw my uh, uncle brutally murder my father and my mother and my brother and I end up in this orphanage and I'm kind of stunned and I distrust people. That's the way that individual may have coped and to force them to see that may do more harm. So as a psychotherapist, for example, what is your take on on that, uh, the human defense mechanisms, I guess? Well, they're there for good reason. Yeah. Um, so I think we need to distinguish between uh, optimal and surplus. Yeah. Some some defense mechanisms do us harm, but defense mechanisms are there for our well-being to give us peace of mind. So, look, you're going to die. I'm going to die. A great deal of the world lives in unremitting misery and poverty. Mm -hmm. Everyone we love is going to to suffer and die. But hey, let's be cheerful. I mean, uh, we, we, it's, it's very important that we're able to blank some of these things out. And Freud recognized that. Yeah. So, um, you know, he, he really didn't have this idea that a lot of contemporary psychotherapists seem to have is that you can, it's even desirable to free people from their self-deceptions completely or their their defense mechanisms completely. No, we need these things. Now, what you were saying about um, happiness, yeah. I, I quite agree. Um, what we are bombarded with images of what it is to lead a worthwhile life. And these images are, of course, ideologically infused. They're the way that um, are uh, very important in our culture. Uh, we attempt to manipulate us. Just turn on the TV. You'll have all sorts of images of what you're supposed to be. And we observe, we absorb these things, and they, they shape us, and they deform us. I think one of the great things about philosophy is it's kind of like a self-defense kit. It gives us tools for fighting back, to standing back a little, and thinking, what are these people trying to do to us? They're saying, you know, if you have this, you'll be happy. You have that, you're happy. You have to be a certain body shape. You have to have a certain income. A certain, and and that's, that's, I think, oppressive nonsense. And it, it runs right through the so-called educational system. Um, so education is only minimally now uh, a matter of helping young people to reflect on their lives and what they want to do with them. Um, it, it's much more sort of um, facilitating their, um, their conformity to the social agenda. 
happiness. I mean, why? First of all, the word is really ambiguous. So it's used to denote a mood, right? A mood of elation. Yeah. It's also, and, and that is clearly, I mean, why should that, why should we be ha happy in that? Why should we aim for happiness in that sense? There's a lot wrong with the world, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's something faintly bizarre about the idea that we should be elated, permanently elated, or elated most of the time. And if that was the case, quite frankly, then surely some pharmaceutical company should just distribute opioids, and we should all take them. That'll make us happy nonstop, no matter what our circumstances. Suppose you're a slave. Yeah. Should be, you be a happy slave? Yeah. Uh, well, there's a sense in which we're all slaves. So outrage and unhappiness are really, really important for a meaningful life. Now, uh, sometimes the word happiness is used somewhat differently to mean um, uh, sort of fulfillment. That's a different story. You can be fulfilled yeah. and be in perpetual pain, right? Lots of creative people are, you know, they lead yeah. very painful lives, but they lead very fulfilling lives, very purposeful lives. So this happiness shit, you know, I, I really think that that needs to be imposed. Right, and I, I was talking, I've started a series speaking with actors, because actors are, uh, for example, different creatures in a sense than uh, a lot of other artists. If I write a book or a uh, play, if I uh, uh, paint a picture or write a symphony, someone can play or read that stuff long after I'm gone, even if like uh, a Kafka or an Emily Dickinson, I don't get my due in my lifetime. But yeah. an actor, while an actor can appear on film or on television, uh, an actor cannot, an actor is dependent upon someone else uh, giving them the say so that you're going to star in this vehicle or, or whatnot, yeah. that people can see you. And so you, uh, the thing with an artist, though, is, too, that uh, an artist, in a sense, it, it gets to the idea of what is not only what is a meaningful life, but what is life. Because when we talk of Homer or Shakespeare, we, we're talking not of the beings that may or, or may not have been in Homer's case, and some people I would say Shakespeare, but... Uh, uh, we're talking about the ideas that they propagated, the things that they put forth, which is their purpose. If we go and say, you know, what is the purpose of a Vermeer painting? Well, we can analyze it and say, well, that that space in the middle does this, that, it affects the yeah, mind yeah. in this way. But it may it may give someone joy. It may say to someone, I can do that, and that gives someone else a purpose. So you have this sort of flowering that art gives that say, you know, I think that just being happy in and of itself won't, because if I'm just happy and I'm sitting there all self-satisfied uh, with my millions, say, and, uh, you know, I'm doing the uh, Citizen Kane thing and I'm, and the only thing that's bugging me is Rosebud, what have I really left behind, you know? Mm, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I mean, art, I think, art is... Art's a lot of things, but one very important thing it is, is it's, it's a kind of alchemy. Art allows us to see the world differently than we saw it before. And I include ourselves in that, you know. Mm -hmm. You and I were part of the world, and so we see ourselves differently in virtue often of the, the impact of, of a work of art on us. Yeah, uh, I wanted to get a little deeper, and so now I have a, a few questions as we end towards this segment. Um, to me, it seems purpose, when we talk about it in a, in a derived uh, way that a conscious being can do, it's inextricable with the idea of free will. I mean, if we don't have free will, then we don't have purpose. If, if we're Sisyphus and we're bound to push up the, show, uh, the boulder because we offended one of the gods, and I forget which god sent him to do that, but Sisyphus was happy in pushing up the boulder. That's his purpose. I'm Sisyphus. I push boulders. Well, then, you know, then he, he doesn't have free will, so he's not really happy. He, he, he's been, you know, opioided by the God. He's been drugged by the God into thinking that he's happy. So when we talk, in at least in the human sense of purpose, uh, isn't that inextricably bound with free will, the idea or our perception of it? 
And so what we mean by free will. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, you know, as you know, it's a somewhat contentious notion. Yeah. So, look, the majority of philosophers nowadays are what are called compatibilists. And basic, basically the idea is this, and we can go into this deeper if you want to, yeah. but the basic idea is this, that um, what, here, here's a sensible idea of freedom. You can reflect on options and you can do what you choose. Now, that's perfectly possible in an entirely deterministic universe, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, there are prior causes that account for my capacity to reflect my preferences, my desires, and so on. I mean, it's not magic. <laughs> they come from somewhere. And there are causal chains that go way back before my birth that account for how I am and therefore what I'm choosing at any given moment. But what matters is that those causal chains run through me. That's, that's the, the necessary condition. And I guess the sufficient condition for me having uh, free will. I can reflect. I can choose. I'm not coerced. So I would I quite agree with you that, um, I, or at least I think I agree with you. Yeah, I think I agree with you that the, the idea of a living purposefully requires um, a degree of autonomy in that way, that things have to be up to you. Um, and, if, and to the degree that you're coerced and oppressed, and in circumstances which do not permit you the luxury of, um, of engineering your life even minimally, uh, to that degree, yeah, you, 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 you can't live a purposeful life. Yeah, now, uh, when you were talking with compatibilism, that's a, a, if you could just take a minute or two to, to define that a little better, because a lot of people, I think, uh, sort of get that it's one of those things that people sometimes uh, go awry on. Yeah, okay, sure. So the, the free will issue is a very old issue in philosophy. And they're basically, basically, here's, here's, here's what makes it an issue. So here, one, one view of the universe is that everything that happens was caused by other things. Yeah. So things don't happen for no reason. And we all kind of accept this generally. So, you know, you go to your car and you turn the key and it doesn't start. Well, something must account for that. Geez, I must have let the, left the light on. At night, yeah, the battery's dead. Or, you know, you're suffering from a, a, a terrible headache. You go to a doctor. Well, why do you go to a doctor? Because you want the, the doctor to determine what the cause of the headache is and to cause that headache to go away. So in most contexts, we're quite happy with the idea of determinism. Everything that happens is caused to happen by prior things that happened. Mm -hmm. And that has, that has an interesting implication, which is that if that's true, then you could take a time slice of the universe say a billion years ago yeah. and if you knew everything that was going on and you knew all the, the laws of physics you could predict everything that would happen in the future of course no one can do that it would require an infinitely powerful intelligence yeah. but that's the idea and from that the idea from that idea we get the idea that well really if determinism is true then there's only one possible future yeah only one physically possible future. So we can picture all kinds of futures, but the, the, you know, it's all rows of dominoes knocking each other down. Now, people get worried about that. They think, oh my God, well, if everything that happens has, is, happens because it was caused by things that happened before, that includes everything that happens inside of me. Yeah. Uh, that includes my choices. So, you know, I'm choosing right now to have a sip of coffee. Well, 
um, that choice must have been caused. And then the people who worry about this say, oh, that must mean it wasn't up to me at all. It wasn't my choice. I don't have any free will. Uh, that's called hard determinism. Yeah. That's the view that, well, their free will is an illusion. No one really chooses anything. Suck it up. Others say, no, nah, there's got to be exceptions to this. I'll accept that all this other stuff is, is caused, but not my choices, or at least some of my choices are not caused. They just sort of, well, now now you have difficulty. Well, how, how do you explain them? Then? Like, uh, and, and that seems really, really quite strange idea when you come to think of it, because all of us want to say, don't we, that the choices that we make are are brought about by our values and our beliefs and our desires. So imagine this, imagine you're hungry and and you, you go get a slice of pizza and you're about to put that pizza into your mouth and the thought suddenly occurs to you, oh my God, my, my, my choice to get a slice of pizza was caused by my being hungry and the fact that I like pizza and that there's a pizza place in my neighborhood, it wasn't free. Yeah. That would be very, very peculiar and arguably nonsensical. So, so that view, that the view that some of our choices at least stand out of outside that network of causation, that's called libertarianism. Now, there's a third view. And this is the third view. The third view is, is compatibilism, and it's the one that nowadays most philosophers accept. And, and that is, really, determinism's irrelevant to, to freedom. Um, the fact that your choices are caused doesn't make them any less choices. It doesn't make them any less up to you. What makes you unfree is, is if you're unable to, to deliberate, to make choices, or you've been manipulated, or you've been coerced, someone's holding a gun to your head, then you're not free. If you're in jail, you're not free. If you're out of jail, you're free. That's, that's basically the compatibilist line. Yeah. So, of course, my brain and your brain and everyone else's brain is the source of the choices that we make, and that brain is a physical system and it's it's governed by the the sorts of laws and causal processes that govern any physical system but that doesn't make us any less free yeah and it should be said that the probably compatibilism comes up most in the ideas when people talk religiously of whether a god is if there is a god a singular god that <laughs> if he or she or it is all knowing because if a god is all knowing then he has to know everything. He has to know every choice that has to be made. Yeah. And so yeah. there can be no free will. And yeah, yeah. you, you get religious people who sometimes try to sort of weasel in ways about that. But I know I've had this argument many times. It, you know, if if you have an all-knowing God, as you describe it, then we can't have free will. Now, you can try to, to change the meaning of what a free will is, but then you're changing the, the, the rules of the game. But um, uh, on, a, on a less... Uh, a less uh, heady level. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, because we mentioned a little bit about uh, earlier, uh, the idea of self-sacrifice in terms of purpose, because we were talking about doing something for God or the state or the yeah. way that why would someone willingly go to, to war, you know, um, or, or whether it's uh, ancient or now. Um, where do you think that the idea of self-sacrifice fits into purpose? Because then we're talking about not a physical purpose that we can sense, because if we're if we're gonna, you know, like modern suicide bombers, if or a kamikaze, if we're going to sacrifice ourselves for some moment of glory in expectation of some uh, afterlife of glory, whether it's seventy one virgins or whatever it is, or whether it's being loved by the emperor for all time, that takes quite a bit of uh, counter programming to the the evolutionary stuff that's been in us for billions of years. Well, we're obviously equipped to to, um, to do to perform actions that um, that 
that are not in our self-interest, right? Yeah. And, and, and many, many other organisms do this as well, right? So, um, you know, think of the uh, spiders, which after mating, the male offers himself as a meal to the female. Well, that doesn't do him a lot of good, right? But that is clearly an instinctive behavior set up by evolution. So it's, it's, it's wrong to think that, uh, and we've known this since the 60s, that evolution entails that uh, the behavior of all organisms is necessarily self-interested. All right, so let's put that evolution to the side then. I mean, just having a kid... <laughs> Is sleepless nights and all sorts of suffering. Yeah. So yeah, for things that matter to us, um, we we can act in ways which cause us pain, and the upper limit of that, which result in our death. Uh, you know, we sacrifice ourselves for those whom we love because they matter so much to us. That's what I referred to uh, in primitive warfare as having skin in the game. Yeah. But but war certainly has its practice now and has been practiced for the last ten thousand years in developed societies isn't like that. So soldiers typically don't really have a personal motivation to um, to risk their own lives or indeed to take the lives of others, which is deeply, as I pointed out, deeply traumatic and troubling act. Uh, and so basically, those who wish to engineer wars have to con us into it. They have to feed us with ideologies. We have, they have to make us think that, you know, um, um, if, if we don't go out and kill these people, um, our civilization will be destroyed, or you know, our our mothers will be raped, or whatever. All oh, the various ways. If you look at the propaganda of war and genocide, uh, elites have found to manipulate the attitudes of those who have to do the the dirty work. Well, uh, in the final segments, I just want to give you a chance to sort of sum up some of the things we've been talking about. But let me end this segment by asking uh, a personal question, not you as a philosopher or you as a researcher. Um, and that would be, uh, do you personally believe that, A, there can be purpose? And if there can be purpose, is it something that we ourselves ultimately have to create? lives for sure um, and uh, uh, leading a purposeful life is a function partially of of luck and partially of ingenuity right so the circumstances into which I'm born the opportunities open to me because of those circumstances and so on and so forth will have a vast impact on my capacity to lead a purposeful life and to some degree, talk of leading purposeful lives is a luxury of people living in relatively affluent circumstances. Yeah. What they call first world, uh, first world right. problems. Yeah. And your, your, your purpose can be if you're living in a lot of places, scraping together enough food to keep your kid alive. Yeah. Uh, and I wouldn't include that under the a grander sounding rubric of a purposeful yeah. life. So yeah, it's uh, there's a that bit I'm emphasizing because it, it is underestimated. And it sh one of the things it shows us is that if we're really interested in purpose, we have to be interested in politics and economics, which set out the framework in which people live. Uh, and if we think living purposefully is a good thing, then we have to, what, what that implies is we need to have a more global perspective rather than, you know, staying in our little affluent bubbles and, and talking about purpose. Yeah, so there's that, but there's also um, our ingenuity, our capacity to engineer lives for ourselves. That capacity itself comes 
out of things that we had no control over. So, you know, the way we were formed, the way we were formed genetically and environmentally and nutritionally, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, ultimately, these dimensions are bound up with one another and they are ultimately rest on the stuff that, um, that um, is outside of our individual control. That's, I think that's the way I want to, to put it. And I really want to emphasize it because when people start talking about purpose, they often go into this sort of magical autonomy as though that, you know, that, that has nothing to do with the opportunities and the good fortune that they have happened to have found themselves in. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll end there on that note in the final segment. I just want to wrap up things uh, and we'll do that in a moment. I've been speaking with philosopher David Livingstone Smith. He's uh, authored a number of books. The two ones we've spoken a bit of have been Less Than Human and The Most Dangerous Animal, where he explores uh, violence and war. But uh, we've also talked uh, a bit more grandly about purpose, and I'll link to both of the books uh, uh, on Amazon, and I'll also link to his uh, website, uh, uh, his web page at the University of New England. Um, so let me just uh, ask you if you could sum up in uh, uh, you know a few minutes uh, the ideas where you think uh, society is say culturally in the idea of purpose, and where do you think it's going? Because we do have this thing coming down the turnpike, whether it's a decade or a half a century, called artificial intelligence, and that may prove to be something of what of a game changer for human beings and how they regard themselves in the cosmos and purpose. So, uh, any ideas on that, or in general? Yeah, um, gee, that's a really hard question to answer. I mean, it's very hard to make inferences about about the future. Anyway, I, I think that uh, artificial intelligence will, for relatively educated people anyway, perhaps help us to make the, I mean, really good artificial, artificial intelligence exists now, but I mean, really fancy yeah. artificial intelligence, right. particularly if it's embedded in realistic kind of humanoid robots, will force us to uh, complete the reassessment of, of ourselves. I mean, we're physical systems. And, um, and although in, we often pay lip service to that, we're complicated flesh and blood machines, the development of artificial machines that s simulate us very, very well, well, I think we're going to have to really do more than pay lip service. Now, this is relatively uh, educated people. I think for most people, this is unlikely to uh, make much of a difference. I mean, most people just take stuff for granted, move on <laughs> and retain their beliefs. And particularly in a highly religious country like the United States, I think that uh, magical thinking about um, what it is to be a human being uh, is likely to be very stubbornly entrenched for, for quite a long time. Well, on that note, uh, I just want to thank you for sharing your time and your insights. Uh, as I said earlier, I'll link to your webpage and some of your books for anyone who's interested uh, can go check them out. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your questions.